Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Imakila Tomwanja, but you can just call me Ima, and I'm from Tanzania. Unfortunately, I couldn't dress really well like Zola because I came here and the great America um, lost my bag, and it's somewhere there. I have no idea where, but yeah, I think it's going to be delivered um, tonight. So then I'll probably come with a dress tomorrow, not presenting them. Um, yeah, so I'll be giving this presentation with my colleague William. Um, who's going to give us some use cases and yeah, I'll just go on. Uh, we're going to talk about the community cadastres and land rights um, and give an example of a pilot project that we did in Tanzania, in an informal settlement in Tanzania and what sort of our next steps are and what we think should be done. So to give you a background, um, this pilot project and what we're proposing is in Dar es Salaam, which is uh, yeah, which is one of Africa's fastest growing cities and it's found in the eastern part of Tanzania close to Zanzibar for those who know it. And it's a uh, it's Tanzania's very like very small city, but it's the most populated ones with a population of around maybe almost seven million people right now. And around seventy percent of these people all live in informal settlements without land rights, without title deeds. Um, and I'm going to explain the reasons why uh, as I'm moving forward. But also uh, in uh, doing research, uh, we found that this is not a problem just in Tanzania, but it's a worldwide problem where we found up to a billion people around the world live without land rights, which is a huge issue because yeah, when you live with land rights, knowing that you have a title deed, you feel that sense of ownership. You can do many things. You can, for example, if you go to the bank, for example, and you want to take loans, you can get loans because you're owning a property. But without that, and if you don't have a car, for example, then it's very difficult for you to get those basic things that you need or you want. So the goal of the project that we want to conduct. First of all, we want to conduct this project in a periodal area in Dar es Salaam. And the goals are basically one, to yeah, conduct the project and then provide a, about a hundred title deeds to people if we can. Um, because when we did the pilot in the periodal areas, we found there are some issues, some challenges until we, we wanted to provide title deeds to the people in the informal settlement. It proved to be difficult. Like we found out an easier technological way, but there are some bureaucratic um, stuff that we had to go through that were, you know, uh, sort of difficult. Uh, the second one is to demonstrate the use of real-time kinematics, RTK, um, GNSS, sorry, I'm, I'm using that uh, short form, but I can explain about it later, and also drone technology and open source tools in order to provide land rights and title deeds to people and to conduct the cadastro service. And also three, to show the benefit of providing uh, land rights to a single community and how that can have an impact worldwide, or let's say in Tanzania, in Africa, and later uh, worldwide. So I'm going to call my colleague William to give us um, to give us use cases on two areas or two countries, and then I'll come back. Okay. Thanks, Ima. Um, maybe I can introduce myself very briefly. <laughs> Microphone's at a different level. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my name is William Evans. Oh, thank you. And um, I've been working with Ima and um, uh, a team in Tanzania for the past three years. And uh, the project that she's presenting to you today is um, built on that understanding. Um, when I arrived in Dar es Salaam about three years ago, um, <clears throat> I was working on a project called Romani Korea, which is addressing um, some, some of the issues around climate change and flooding that occur annually in Dar es Salaam. And one of the most basic and repeated facts is this figure that Ima shared with you, which is that up to 70% of the city is informal. And we know that this is a problem across Africa and across much of the developing world. Um, <clears throat> so Ima will talk specifically about what was done in Tanzania and some of the tools and processes that, that we're using to carry the project forward. But we thought it would be interesting to also bring in a few other use cases. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is India. Um, <clears throat> so in 2020, uh, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, Modi um, basically announced this, this project where he was going to be using drones um, across villages in, in rural India 
to try out this pilot initiative to, to provide title deeds. Um, <clears throat> and this is essentially one of the takeaways that we came, came away with in, in our research and in our work in Tanzania. Um, and essentially, this is what he is doing. Um, India is much larger than a lot of countries, so in, in some cases, um, what he's doing there is still considered a pilot. Um, so when we were researching what they're doing in India, it's very much what we're recommending, which is using emerging tools that are accessible to many people, uh, combined with community mapping. Uh, what they found so far is that there have been a lot of challenges and land disputes, even with this process. And so that is why at the bottom here we say the missing link is community meetings. One of the key things that we're advocating for with community cadastres is actually mobilizing the entire community to come together. So like a lot of the work that we've done in Dar es Salaam involves basically going in and spending a lot of time with, with local residents actually coming together around the table, looking at a map together and really agreeing together as a community rather than simply sending, let's say, government officials to the door unplanned, unannounced, and saying, hey, who's here? Because what ha has happened in India is people will show up to the door, and maybe um, the, the father or the mother is out to work, and whoever's around will just register the title deed. So it has actually created some land disputes even from, from within that project. In Rwanda, Rwanda and Ethiopia are often cited as some of the, the best examples of, of title deeds and land rights. So back in 2012, um, they completed a four-year project, and actually going all the way back to 2005, Rwanda has been quite strategic in trying to get title deeds for the entire country. Um, and so what they did is basically used aerial, aerial imagery. Um, it wasn't drones, it was helicopters and airplanes at the time. Um, it was a little bit before drone technology was as accessible and as powerful as it is today. But what they did is basically collected aerial imagery of the entire country. Um, now, again, Rwanda is much smaller than India and Tanzania, so it was a little bit easier to achieve. But what they did with that is they were able to go in and hold these community meetings. Um, locally recruited committees were brought in to settle these disagreements, so it's basically neighbors mapping neighbors. It's coming in and saying, hey, here's, your Im here, here's the imagery. Can you identify your plot? Okay, can your neighbor also agree on this? Um, and so through that process, Rwanda has been able to make itself one of, one of the best mapped and titled countries in the world. Um, <clears throat> I think World Bank breaks it like number eight or something in the world, um, whereas Tanzania is still very low right now. Um, but, but the use of these emerging technologies combined with the, the community going in, I think they hired over 5,000 people to go to all of these different villages throughout the country and to sit down with people. And as many of you know, uh, who have worked with maps, when you are able to sit down with a group, group of people around maps, it makes it very easy to distinguish, okay, this is where I live, this is, this is what our community looks like. So now, uh, Ima will take you through what, what happened in Tanzania. Uh, thanks, Will. Yeah, so... Hi, dear friends. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so in Tanzania, basically, before I take you through the pilot that we did, I'd like to let you know, first of all, the cadastro survey process, well, not the whole process because it's long and bureaucratic, but yeah, just the cadastro survey and how that whole process in Tanzania works. So in Tanzania, we there, there are two uh, things that are done, and it's providing cadastro surveys in both urban and rural areas. And in urban areas, uh, there like most urban areas have these. Okay, before I go on, are there any? Is there anyone who is a land surveyor in here, or someone that knows about urban planning? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, when when doing planning, there is this thing called a town planning drawing, where which shows um, the. Let's say the area with the houses and the infrastructure and all that, which is usually used when you want to do uh, regularization or yeah, provide title deeds basically. But these in Tanzania are mainly found in only in urban areas. And so if you want to go to a rural area or a pre urban area and you want to follow the same process, it's difficult because they don't have the town planning drawings. And so when you go to rural areas, pre urban areas, you don't find a lot of people owning title deeds. And they can tell you that they own land, 
because of what I'm going to say next. So there are two forms of occupancy in Tanzania, which is one, the granted right of occupancy, which this is the, basically the one that you get from the government after going the, um, through this whole process, and you can show them that you have a title deed. And the second one is the customary right of occupancy, which is basically inheritance. So if I had my grandfather, my great-grandfather who owned land in Tanzania, and then it was um, inherited to me, yeah, I can just say that I own that land as well. But you know, the government doesn't know that. Oh, not me. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the challenges that we um, that Tanzania cadastral service usually face is one, it's inefficient and it's time consuming because you can start um, following through your uh, getting your title deed now, and then you can come and get it in like uh, five years, for example, three years. Two, it's um, it's expensive. For most people, $70 might not seem as much, but for residents in Tanzania, it's a lot for some, some of them. Uh, I won't show this video because I am running out of time, but this video is basically we went um, to the community and we were asking them like how much, for example, they might be able to um, afford or maybe what is the reason that is causing them to not have title deeds, and most of them are saying it's because it's expensive, and seventy dollars for them is expensive. They're saying at least if it was twenty dollars, and why is it expensive? It, one reason is because the tools that are used by the surveyors are also very expensive. So if the surveyors are using like a ten thousand dollar tool, they cannot come and. Uh, survey your land and then give it to you for like twenty dollars. Obviously, they're going, they want to make profit and they'll do it for you know more. Uh, and also, there is violence and insecurity, and the uh, title deed that whole process is not commissioned in a transparent manner, so they're not involving the community. This um, okay. Let me go to this and then I'll come back to the other one. Yeah, so the solution that we're trying to propose here is one, the use of dual frequency sensors, so GNSS and um, real time kinematic. So this means using low cost and high accuracy dual frequency sensors. And this map here shows. You know, the red dots are the dots that we took using the low cost uh, geo frequency sensor, which is like $200. And the green dots are the ones that are used by the surveyors um, with like $10,000 equipment. What we came to realize is that the low cost um, device is the one that had sometimes even more accuracy than the more expensive one. So if we can use the low cost geo, um, geo frequency, uh, sensors, then it means that we can even be able to reduce the prices of land rights to people and more people can own their land. Oh, not yet. And then the second thing is what uh, we'll just explain in um, India and Rwanda, but yeah, we found that this is also something that is eff efficient and effective. So if we uh, use the drone technology and we mount the geofrequency sensors on the drones, it means that we'll have high accurate Im imagery, we'll have um, high accurate data or points, and so even when we go to the communities and we put the imagery there and the points, it will be easy for them to pinpoint exactly where the house is located and it will reduce even the, okay, it will reduce even the, um, you know, amount of conflicts that occur between people because um, you know how land rights can um, provide, sorry, can give a lot of conflicts. So um, all this is to bring me to the third thing, which is advocating for community cadastres, which is basically working with the community to pinpoint exactly where their, uh, where their property is located. So if I have my property here and my neighbor has their property there and here, then I can bring them in one um, meeting, for example, and they can show me where their uh, boundaries are located, and we'll be able to work together to provide them with the um, title deeds. Instead of, for example, if I have money and I want to get a title deed for myself, I can just go uh, work with the survey, and then later I can say, oh, these are my points, and then I'm provided with that title deed. But then if my neighbor later wants to get their own title deed, and they come and look at mine, it's like, there might be some discrepancies which will then cause um, a lot of conflict. Uh, so to sum up, how OSM and open source tools can play a role. Um, when working, like I've been working with OSM since 2015, and yeah, it has. We've done a lot of things, you know, like disaster mapping and um, humanitarian response and all that. But this is, I think, another way where OSM can help. That we think that OSM can also help people. 
Like you can have projects that are map, people are mapping buildings, are mapping infrastructures, and they're just saying building yes, but also so yeah, that building is there, and you're recognizing that someone is there. But can you take it to another step? How can you um, use OSM to make it beneficial to people? For example, for Hot right now, we have the Audacious project, and we are uh, planning to map home uh, home to a billion people around the world. So how can we take that to another step? How can we make OSM be more effective or efficient or helpful to people? One thing is providing them with the land rights that they need. So using that data and, thank you, the solution to um, provide people with the land rights. Thanks.